I think that the timing of this text, the Temptations of Christ on Lent 1, is probably one of the best timings of a scripture to people's reality that we ever get in the year. And, and why? Well, last Wednesday we started Lent, right? We know that was called? Yes. All right, we're learning stuff. Okay. So we, so we know it was Ash Wednesday, and Ash Wednesday is the beginning of Lent, and if you were here for Ash Wednesday or if you watched online, you know that I challenged you all to find something, some spiritual thing to either give up or to pick up to do during Lent that will bring you closer to God, okay? Whatever that might be, and just one little thing in hopes that over the next 40 days you become in at least one little way a little bit more the person God calls you to be right? Because we all have places we can be a little bit better. Again, whether or not that's giving something up or picking something up, right? And so, because there's a universal truth about cheeseburgers, we come today. You know what the universal truth about a cheeseburger is? There is no cheeseburger that is better than the cheeseburger you eat five days into a diet, right? I mean, that is true. And so if you've given something up for Lent or you're trying to pick something up, there is nothing better than doing the opposite of right about now. There is nothing better than temptation. And so we go into this discussion over the different types of temptations that we as Christians face on a daily basis and talk about it in an honest and truthful way. So let's look at each one of the temptations. The first temptation we run into is what we all think of when the pastor starts saying the word temptation, right? You're hungry, you want food, there is food, you just take food, right? Even if you know, you shouldn't. You want the cheeseburger, it has bacon, it's calling to you, you eat cheeseburger. And yet, we know that as much as we want it, as much as we are tempted towards it, it doesn't actually fill the hole we're trying to fill. Right? If you finish off the entire box of Thin Mints, you don't actually feel better at the end. <laughs> we know that, and it's true in our own spiritual lives, when we start our new disciplines or give up that thing that has been holding us back. And yet, it is such core to human nature to struggle just about this far in. I think most people get that. Because most people experience that over and over in life, right? But then we get to this second temptation, right? So, devil tries that. Jesus, you know, has his answer. And the devil's like, okay, fine. We'll try something else. So, he goes ahead and he shows them all the kingdoms of the world, their riches. And I want you to make sure you heard this and their authority, right? And their power. So it's not just about being wealthy or about being famous, but it's about the power one would have to shape the world the way they wanted. Good or bad or otherwise, right? And the devil comes and says, Jesus, I'll give you all the power of the world. All you got to do is worship me. On one side, that actually doesn't sound like a bad idea, Right? I mean, if Jesus was really, like, president of everyone, and yet we know that that would have been horrible, right? Because it would have derailed God's plan completely. And I think it represents all the times in our life in which things which aren't bad, wealth isn't bad, fame isn't bad, uh, esteem isn't bad, awards or accolades aren't bad in and of themselves, right? But it's what people do to achieve that that can be really bad. I worked as a dispatcher. There are a lot of folks who've done really bad things for money or for fame or for accolades. I'm sure you all can think of all sorts of folks who've done things that are not good for all those. If you don't know, look up Bertie Madoff. Yeah, right? And so it's a reminder to us that it's not just the thing we're doing but why we're doing it. And that there's a temptation, even in noble calling sometimes, in which you can slowly lose yourself in the pursuit 
of the accolade, or of the fame, or of the wealth, or of whatever it is you are pursuing. And by that, lose yourself. And I think most folks, especially if you're old enough, you've probably seen people who have lost themselves to their job, to fame, to whatever. Then we come to this third temptation. Now, I think it's really interesting that the devil doesn't give up. Like, if you think about it, it's really weird that the devil doesn't give up. Because he literally offered Jesus everything in the world, like literally. And Jesus was like, nah. You'd think you'd back down then. Because what else do you have to offer if not everything in the world? So I want you to focus in on this, because I think this is a key to a whole different type of temptation we don't talk about enough. So what happens is this. He says, Jesus, buddy, we'll go to Jerusalem. We're going to go to the pinnacle of the temple. So think about this as like, we're going to go stand on the White House or on the top of the Capitol Dome, someplace the world would not miss you. Okay? And we're going to stand there, and I want you to throw yourself down. Don't worry, I'm not trying to kill you, because I know that it says in the Old Testament, if you throw yourself down and you are the Messiah, the angels will catch you before your foot hits a stone. So you'll be saved. Which seems like a really weird temptation, like throw yourself off a building and get saved. How is that tempting? Well, here's where the temptation lies. If Jesus had done that, if Jesus had taken the devil up on this offer, every Pharisee, every Sadducee, every scribe, everyone in the holiest city of Jerusalem would have seen it, right? And man, they would have believed in Jesus. He would have had no problem walking into the synagogue or into the temple and saying, I'm the Messiah, you all just saw the angels, right? And everyone would be like, dude, whatever you want. Now put yourself in Jesus' shoes for just a minute. God has said that his plan for you is that you're going to go have a mock kangaroo court, and then they're going to kill you in a slow and horribly painful way. And that that's God's plan. Devil's like, dude, how about not dying a horrible way? Not dying at all? And everyone believes. Is that not a better plan? It takes you pause right there, right? But see, here's the catch. If Jesus had taken God or taken the devil's plan, well, he might have had everyone believe in him and believe that he is the Messiah. He never would have died on a cross. If he never died on the cross, he never resurrects. There is no Good Friday, no Easter, if he takes the devil's plan. And while everyone might believe in him, none of us are saved. Because no one's sins are forgiven. See, sometimes for evil to win, good simply has to be silent. History is full of that. I think the reason I love having this story this day, this piece of the Bible, this wonderful piece of Scripture, this brilliant truth, is because as we walk along our journey, any time we commit ourselves, be it Lent or any other time, to following God more, the temptation of our own stomach, the temptations of the world, or just the temptation to be silent creeps in so quickly to lead us off the path. And yet today it reminds us that as Christians we are called to push back against all those forms of temptation and to walk forward in truth and light with all that we do and all that we are. So as you take a few minutes this week in your prayer life, Ask yourself, are any of these temptations pulling you back from the spiritual disciplines you're trying to pick up or the things you're trying to put behind you? And ask yourself even deeper, are there ways 
the old you, or the world, or whatever imagery you want to use, is pulling you away from the person God is trying to make you into. Amen.